So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Welcome to The Art of Catholic. I'm Matthew Leonard. I am so glad to have you with me wherever you are in the world. Uh, the passage you just heard me read is Genesis 1.27. It's one with which I am sure you are familiar, but I think that today you're going to come to a deeper appreciation of just how amazing and unique you are as a human being created in the image of God. And what we're going to do in this episode is to explore some of the fundamental ideas at the heart of the teaching of St. John Paul II's philosophy, which is known as personalism. And this is huge because John Paul II's teaching is extremely important for what's going on in the world today. I mean, let's be honest, humanity is having an identity crisis on so many levels, and it's like the Pope knew what was coming and spoke right to it decades ago. Now, before I tell you about my wonderful guest who is going to break this down for us, I'd like to just ask you to please subscribe to the show, share it with your friends on social media. Let's get it out there. Uh, I'd also like uh, to invite you to help me spread more authentic Catholic teaching across the world by supporting me on Patreon. I would love to get more of this out, but uh, I need some help. So if you're so moved, I'd appreciate you going to patreon.com slash Matthew Leonard, chipping in to help make that possible. And if you do that, you get access to private interviews and free books and Next Level Catholic Academy and more depending on your level of support. And even five or 10 bucks a month is extremely beneficial. So thank you for that. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, there's a link uh, down in the description. All right, uh, let's get to the show. And I'd like to tell you a quick intro story that lays a little bit of foundation for my guest today. And I didn't tell him I was going to tell this story. But many <laughs> moons ago, I had the privilege of taking a, a class in graduate school titled Faith and Reason. And it was taught by Dr. Pat Lee, who is a well-known Thomas philosopher at Franciscan University. And Dr. Lee invited several distinguished philosophers from around the country to come and address our class at various uh, points in the semester. And it was, it was pretty amazing because we had some big names in the philosophical world grace our little class. Now that said, in both my opinion and that of my then girlfriend and now wife, Veronica, one man stole the show. And it was the gentleman who you are about to enjoy on the art of Catholic. And his name is Dr. John Crosby. And in that class, he was very thoughtful. He was clear. Uh, he just injected beautiful life into our class. And the wonderful thing was that his office was right down the hall from Pat Lee. So he was local. He didn't have to fly in from anywhere. And over the last 20 years, I have had the pleasure of getting to know him and spending time with him and his family on numerous occasions. And that said, let me just give you the formal tale of the tape on Dr. Crosby so that you guys know who he is, even though I know him. He is a professor of philosophy at Franciscan University of Steubenville. He's known internationally for his work on John Henry Newman, uh, Max Shaler, Carol Wojtyla, who's John Paul II, and Dietrich von Hildebrand, who has grown a great deal in popularity as of late, especially. Uh, his studies have taken him from Georgetown University to the University of Salzburg, and before Franciscan University, he was at the University of Dallas. He held the Prince Franz Joseph and Princess Gina Chair for Ethics at the International Academy of Philosophy. And if you're thinking he might be a little too high class for this program, you're probably right. But he has authored numerous books, one of which we are going to focus on today. It's titled The Personalism of John Paul II. So without any further ado, I would like to welcome Dr. Crosby to the Art of Catholic. Good. Thank you, Matt. Thank you for that warm welcome. And uh it's nice to know that uh, what I say in class sometimes is heard and uh, <laughs> leaves, leaves even a lasting impression. <laughs> it left quite an impression. I believe that you were teaching on Newman uh, in that yeah. class. And at some point, I'd love to have you come back and speak on Newman, which yeah. was a possible topic for this program. But I chose to do John Paul II instead for this one. But I, I would love to have you back to talk about him because you make him come yeah, alive in I, such a way. It's just incredible. Especially now in the year of his canonization. That's uh, exactly uh, it's right. It's a good idea to learn. It's a great occasion to learn more about Newman. Now, one of the things I, I left out of your bio is that uh, you were a student of Dietrich von Hildebrand. That's right. And That's right. Uh, he informs a lot of your thought and your writing. And you, along with your son, John Henry Crosby, uh, you guys founded the Hildebrand Project together. That's right. That's to right. promote the writings of Dietrich von Hildebrand. And of course, That's right to get uh, his works back into circulation, to translate the many untranslated works, uh, and to stimulate discussion uh, about his uh, rich philosophical legacy. Yes, that's a big 
uh, common project of me and my son and his uh, Hildebrand legacy project. And the, the listeners of The Art of Catholic are familiar with uh, your son because he was my very first guest on this oh, program uh, discussing one of those books that you guys translated through the project. So it's, yeah. a, it's a long legacy of the Hildebrand legacy project uh, for The Art of Catholic. Yeah. Now, uh, before we uh, before we jump into the actual philosophy of John Paul II, I, I thought that it would be very helpful to remind people a little bit about the historical context of what right. was going on in the world and in the life of then Carol of Oitiwa and, and how that kind of impacted his philosophical thought. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, there there is certainly a, uh, an obvious connection between the life story of uh, John Paul and his philosophy. You have to remember he was a boy of 19 when um, Hitler invaded Poland and occupied Poland. So young Karol Wojtyla, uh, as he is called prior to becoming Pope, experienced that, uh, that tyranny, uh, that Nazi terror uh, in, uh, in Poland. Uh, that was in 39. And then after the war in 45, the Germans are gone, but now um, Poland is in effect annexed to Soviet Russia. So uh, he jumped out of the frying pan of Nazism into the fire of communism. Uh, and he often describes uh, what he experienced in the treatment of uh, people uh, as a pulverization of the human person. That is, uh, an extreme degradation, uh, a, a horrific violation of the person. And that, without a doubt, stimulated his reflection on the, the dignity of the person. It made him want to go deeper uh, and to retrieve this precious thing of the dignity of persons just at a time when it was being so brutally violated. You know, it's an interesting fact that sometimes um, the truth about a thing flashes up for us uh, when the thing is lost or destroyed or violated, uh, then we often see for the first time uh, the, the real splendor of the thing. And, and so with the degradation, the pulverization of the human person, uh, that gave John Paul the impetus to look anew into this mystery of each human person and to try to rehabilitate that as a response to the horrors of, of the time. Well, let's talk about that because he is known for what we call in the vernacular personalism. Yeah. And, right. and let's actually, let's back up just a second. Let's talk about philosophy just for a moment because, you know, yeah. philosophy for a lot of people is, you know, a bunch of people with head in the clouds. They don't really understand how it relates to everyday right. life. Exactly. Why is it we need, why do, why do Christians need philosophy? Yes, well, you know, um, they, uh, uh, there's a long history of uh, Christians needing philosophy. Uh, uh, the earliest Christians drank deeply at the uh, well of Plato. Uh, later on, it was Aristotle. Uh, so Greek philosophy has played an enormous role in the articulation of the Christian faith. And so John Paul participates in that uh, tradition, and he wants us to know that when we talk about an issue, we don't have this, this false alternative of either faith or natural science. That's what most people tend to think. You ask a question about man and woman, well, you say what you can on the basis of natural science, and then nothing remains but your faith in some uh, vision of man and woman. And John Paul wants to say, no, there's a power of reason that's something other than just natural science and something that is not faith, but rather reason. And uh, we believers need uh, that work of reason in order to appropriate and, and articulate and understand rightly uh, the revelation that is entrusted. Uh, to yeah. us, Perfect. so yeah, uh, yeah that, that's uh, that, 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 it, it's very important uh, to him, and so he went very deep in his own philosophical study, sensing that there's something for his work as an evangelist uh, that he needed 
and that only philosophy could give him. You'd also have to say that it probably helped him to speak to the broader world as well. I mean, we all know he traveled all over Kingdom right. Come, and mm -hmm. and you can't just go back to sacred scripture or magisterial teachings when you're right. talking to people in the right. world, and you need that exactly. philosophical foundation. That's right, and so he tries to think about the human person, not just as an object of biology or psychology, but philosophically. Uh, what, is, what does it mean to be a person? What is that free will of a person? All questions that are reserved to philosophy, and therefore philosophy is, a and, and in particular his personalist philosophy, a major tool in his, uh, and major arrow in his evangelistic quiver. Uh, Matt. <laughs> well, let's talk about that personalism. And I mean, probably the vast majority of the audience, they don't know what personalism is. So give yeah. us a, a sketch of, of what it is. Right, right. Now, I will say uh, that John Paul's own writings are often not easy to understand, especially the philosophical writings. And so therefore, I wrote uh, this uh, little booklet on the personalism of John Paul. I tried to reduce to simplest terms. Uh, the uh, main insights. And you did a great job, by the way. I mean, of his personalism. Th this is fantastic. And I, I just want to tell people this is less than 100 pages, yeah. and it's not a large book, and yet it is really clear and concise. And so, kudos to you on this publication. Yeah. You're not saying that it's personalism for dummies, are you? <laughs> <laughs> well, if I read it, it probably speaks to that fact. <laughs> so, uh, personalism. Uh, it is simply a, an approach to the human being that takes very seriously the mystery of each human being, the mysterious free will at the center of each human being, the unpredictability of each human being, uh, the fact that a human being is never just uh, an instance or a specimen of uh, the humankind, but is unique and unrepeatable. So these facts that uh, highlight the mystery of being a person, that stands at the center of, uh, of, of Christian personalism. And, and so uh, that stands at the center of John Paul's personalism. So it's, ag it's against uh, philosophies that like reduce the human being. Uh, to, let's say, just um, uh, a, a being that's completely determined by natural causes. Uh, so that when we act, we're just transmitting an impulse that comes from outside of us. We don't really originate anything in, in a way that makes us responsible. So he is out to overcome these bad um, uh, philosophies of the person that uh, degrade, in effect, the human person. He wants to recover the mystery uh, of personhood that has been so lost in our time. Well, let's talk about what he himself, or what you describe in the book as the personalist norm of, yeah. of John Paul II. And I'm going to state a portion of it, and then I'm going to allow you to kind of follow up on it. Because yeah. Uh, yeah. the Pope wrote, in its positive form, the personalist norm says that the person is a good toward which the only proper and adequate attitude is love. What does he mean by that? Well, um, there's a, an earlier part of the norm that we should also um, factor in here, and that is that persons are beings that should never be used uh, or manipulated or commodified, uh, but rather being such that they ought always to be loved. Uh, and so he, um, that, that's an idea that, um, uh, arose in the 18th century in uh, the philosophical world, this, uh, this idea that persons should never be used, but, but that each person is somehow a being of his or her own, uh, and therefore never rightly instrumentalized uh, for my purposes. Uh, so John Paul diagnoses, like a good doctor, all the different ways in which persons are in fact manipulated or stereotyped. Uh, or objectified, uh, or in some way reduced to something less than they are. And the personalist norm announces a fundamental respect that is owed uh, to persons. So 
basically we want to treat the other person as a subject and not as an object, exactly. right? Yeah, right. So we yeah. can't use them for our own ends, even right. if, even, and that use is wrong, even if there's mutual consent, right? Yeah, that's right. Exactly. There can, you can uh, uh, violate the personalist norm even if you're not coercing the other, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, if the prostitute consents to be used by her customers, she is violated as person. She's still being used for their gratification. That's unworthy of her as person. And her consent doesn't uh, bring that into uh, moral order. You know, this kind of plays into the idea of, of the Pope's idea of freedom. There was a place in the book where you quoted a so-called Catholic feminist who made a statement related to this, and it seems to be an attitude that is so pervasive in the world yeah, today. Right. Uh, and she said that God doesn't care what we do with each other's bodies. He only cares yes. whether we treat each other as persons. Yeah, so in other words, yeah. so long as we don't impose ourselves upon someone else by force, you know, like, like you just said, with mutual right. consent. Yes. We, we just, uh, yeah, that's the, uh, uh, the, the widespread... Uh, liberal idea that the only real violation of a person is uh, coercion, force. Uh, but there can uh, uh, be, uh, you know, grievous violation uh, even in the presence of full consent. You know, if somebody asks me uh, to um, uh, take their lives because they're suffering so greatly and I oblige them and supply uh, the euthanasia that they request, I do violence to them as person, even though they've asked for it. So there's more to um, the personalist norm than just avoiding coercion of persons. What does John Paul II mean when he says that we have to take our interiority as persons into yes. account in order right. for us to even, even understand who we are in and of ourselves as persons? Yeah, right, right. Yeah, that idea of interiority is very... Uh, fundamental, and uh, it, it, the idea is that each person, when you look more closely, um, lives out of a, an inner center. Each uh, person is his or her own. A person's never an extension of something else, um, a mere part of a larger whole, but is something of his or her own. And that's the interiority of the person, that being gathered into um, a mysterious center that makes them to be a person. Um, you, you, there's a play on, on the term subject and object. So if we just treat a person as an object, we do violence to them. We have to acknowledge them as subject. Sometimes John Paul says we have to honor the subjectivity of persons. That's an unusual uh, word. That uh, we don't use every day, but it's a philosophical term, which really means interiority. That the person's not just things uh, uh, that are uh, out there available for our use, but they are gathered into this mysterious center. One of the things, uh, one of the statements that I remember is actually uh, my friend Michael Miller, who's been on this program as well, who was one of your students at one point yes, in time. Right. Right. And uh, in fact, I believe he's on the board of the Hildebrand Project. He is. <laughs> but he first communicated to me, and I had just come into the church, and I was just kind of wading through uh, the, and, and being introduced to Catholic theology and philosophy on a much deeper level. And he related to me something that came from the pen of John Paul II that has stuck with me for a long, long time. And, and the basic idea is that the Pope said a person must possess himself before he can give himself away. Yes, right. and, and I thought, this is one of the most profound things upon further reflection that I had ever heard in my life. And yes, I often right. bring this up when I am teaching in relationship to uh, penance and, and things of that nature, because you can't give away what you don't own. You have to first rein in your appetites before you can right. actually make a gift of yourself back right. to God. But what's yes. interesting about that is the underlying idea in the statement is that a person can actually possess themselves. They yes. belong to themselves. And yet, um, yeah. I would imagine that some people would have a little bit of issue and have brought up the fact that, well, do we really belong to ourselves or do we belong to God? Yeah, and what would the Pope right. say about that? Yes. All right. Well, um, he um, frequently uses that language of persons belonging to themselves, uh, possessing themselves. 
uh, being handed over to themselves, being capable of governing themselves. So this is fundamental to the personalism of John Paul. Uh, and it's all just an unpacking of the fact that um, uh, we are owed this fundamental respect. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and we're, we're hypersensitive, you might say, to being manipulated and stereotyped because then uh, this, um, this, this personhood is, is lost. Now, it looks as if we are in competition with God. How is it that we exist in our own right for our own sakes? That's the language we would use to God, and we just exist for the service of God. But John Paul um, wants to say that even God, um, uh, or rather, most of all, God recognizes the fact that we belong to ourselves and that uh, this is why God shows such uh, often shocking respect for our freedom. We always wonder, why doesn't God intervene? Why does he let uh, evil flourish and people exercise their freedom so destructively? Well, that's because he is respecting us as persons. He's giving us space uh, uh, to determine ourselves. He, he will not coerce us into heaven. He will solicit and plead for our yes, but he waits for that yes. And so uh, we have to, he waits until we exercise our self-possession uh, so that we give a, a gift of ourselves to God. So the self-possession, you have that quite right, is, is tied to the idea of self-gift. We're called to give ourselves to other persons in a special way between man and woman, but also to God. Uh, but the foundation of that giving of oneself is a prior belonging of oneself to oneself. And therefore, it doesn't make us autonomous in a bad way to say that we belong to ourselves. It just explains how it is that we're capable of this fundamental gift of ourselves to others. That is the real life of a person. So in order for us to be able to give ourselves away, uh, we have to be able to possess ourselves, which if the end is to give ourselves away, right? Um, really, this is a kind of a Trinitarian, I mean, he's getting this yeah. from the, the life of the Trinity. In fact, I, if, correct me if I'm right. wrong, but I think in a letter he wrote to the daughters of St. Paul, he said, mm -hmm. God in his deepest mystery is not a solitude, but a family, because he has yeah, within himself exactly. fatherhood, sonship, exactly. and the essence of the family, which is love. Right. And right. so this self-donation that we're talking about here, uh, right. that John Paul's, it just permeates everything that is that, that he right. writes, is really founded upon an understanding of the Trinity. Yes, right. It is. It is. And it's a rather original understanding, because traditionally, when the great theologians looked for images of the Trinity, they would look for three things in one person, like intellect, will, memory in St. Augustine. But the originality of John Paul is that the Trinity is seen not within one person primarily, but in interpersonal relation among persons. So, so the man-woman relation is an eminent image of the Trinitarian life of God. So uh, to bring in multiple persons, <laughs> Uh, and they're being related to each other and, and made for self-donation. That's a, an original development of our, our thinking about the image of the Trinitarian God in us. This is the argument that I often bring in when I'm speaking around the country with regard to contraception, because if our relationships are supposed to be one of mutual self-donation and self-gift, yeah. then once, and, and we're imaging the Trinity in that directly, once right. we introduce any blockage, so to speak, which contraception would do in the conjugal act, all of a sudden right. we're no longer imaging God anymore. We're not making yeah. a gift of ourselves like they do to each other in their eternal that's, relationship. That's right. that's right. And and as he says, we begin to uh, uh, use the spouse uh, and, and depersonalize the spouse. So he connects the disorder of contraception with his personalism very closely. Yeah, and that, that use and disorder can actually take place even within the bounds of marriage. Yes, right? yes it, it, right, exactly. He makes that point. He shocked the world when he said it for the first time. 
back in 81, where he said the adultery in the heart condemned by our Lord can be committed even within marriage. So if there's just unbridled lust without any account of the well-being of the uh, spouse, uh, you know, that can't be defended, not even if the man and woman are married, not even if they're open to procreation. The element of gross using, even in marriage, is out of order from, a, from his personalist perspective. So you always have to grow in that attitude of love and self-donation yeah. toward the other person That's to right. guard against this. That's the defense. Exactly. Right? Exactly. 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 Well, let, let's talk about um, gender difference for a minute, because for John Paul II, this obviously has huge ramifications for today. There's so much gender confusion. Yeah, uh, but, right. you know, for, for John Paul II, gender uh, difference wasn't just biological. It was a personal thing. That's right. Uh, That's right. So, right. you know, no pun intended, but flesh that out a little bit for us. Yeah. You know, um, there's a beautiful set of addresses that John Paul gave in, I think, 97, uh, in the run-up to the Beijing Conference on Woman. Uh, and uh, it, it's some of uh, his richest thought, published under the title, The Genius of Woman. Uh, and he traces um, the genius of woman back to the capacity for motherhood. He argues that a woman has uh, a particular uh, relationship to the concrete and the personal, thanks to her vocation to womanhood. Man, by contrast, often lives for uh, long-range goals and for the efficient production of goals, but woman has, by her nature, as being destined for motherhood, this, uh, this, this sense of the concrete person. She is averse to um, the abstraction uh, in which we men uh, too often live. And so, in, in a way, uh, he, he's saying there's special strength that women have vis-a-vis -vis men, because uh, if they have a special sense for the person, why, in the framework of his personalism, that's almost a point of superiority <laughs> to men. And then he develops beautifully the idea that uh, so often uh, life gets disordered when uh, either uh, you know, the male productive uh, abstractionist approach dominates or uh, the female, and, 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 and he thinks that man and woman have so much to give uh, each other that woman can take a certain brutal edge off of the productive activity of men uh, and, and introduce a kind of personalist softening of the heart. Uh, and woman receives in her way uh, something that only man can give. But the complementarity of man and woman is very profoundly thought through uh, by John Paul. And this, this is there, it's present even outside of procreation. It's there by virtue right. of the relationship between man and woman, the complementarity, right. correct? Right, right, exactly, yes. No, that my um, uh, revered teacher, uh, Dietrich von Hildebrand, once wrote a, a beautiful essay called The Importance of Man and Woman for Each Other Outside of Marriage. And this complementarity makes itself felt in many ways, uh, uh, even outside of marriage. John Paul himself had very close, strong bonds and friendships with certain women in his life. Well, let, let's uh, shift a little bit here and let's talk about the idea of embodiment because this yeah. obviously ties into a little bit of what we've been talking about already. Oh. But again, given what's happening in the world, uh, the understanding that the Pope had of this is really, it's important. So yeah. let's talk, explain what, what embodiment is and why yes. it's important. Well, it, when John Paul speaks of embodiment, he is pushing back against what uh, the philosopher Maritain called angelism. Angelism is the view that we human beings are really like angelic spirits uh, caught up in a body. And uh, the real Catholic view uh, is not angelistic, uh, but it's the one which John Paul expresses in terms of embodiment, namely that our body and, and our gender uh, is fundamental to our being as this or that human person. 
So what, what is the nuptial meaning of the body and the sacramental well, that, that, meaning? Yes, right. That uh, it comes up in the theology of the body. It's no accident that John Paul uh, uh, thinks through his uh, opposition to angelism by developing this elaborate theology of the body, uh, where one sees how the body is embedded in the human person and expressive of the person. Embodiment is really... Uh, a personalist understanding of the body rather than thinking of an instrumental understanding of the body where I use it as an instrument for acting. John Paul um, says the, the grandeur of the human body is that it's like uh, a sacrament of, uh, of the person. The interior world of the person receives a unique expression in the bodily makeup and the interior world of man and of woman is expressed in the gender difference. And and this is something that flies in the face of the idea of the world where we're just kind of Lego pieces that can be, you know, taken yeah. apart and put back together any way right. we want. Yeah, yeah. Like, you know, there are all kinds of proposals in bioethics now uh, that, uh, you know, we uh, uh, perform the... Uh, uh, fertilization in vitro and then we examine the embryo and uh, you know if there's a genetic defect we get rid of it if there are too many genetic defects we uh, throw the embryo out and start over again so you know this is uh, you know treating the human body as just biological material to be manipulated it does not respect the fact that this is the body of a very young and early person is the personalism that John Paul II taught, is it, is it wedded to or does it go against the uh, uh, other major philosophical thought? Because there are people who try and drive, uh, drive a wedge in between John Paul yeah. II and those who came before him. Yes, uh, right. is, it, is his realist philosophy something that's building on the shoulders of what came before yes. in Catholic tradition? Right. Right. Yes, well, I, as I see it, um, he, there are two main sources of his thought. Uh, there is the traditional Aristotelian Thomistic tradition, which he studied deeply in the seminary and later. Uh, but then there is the 20th century personalist tradition, uh, represented for him, especially by the uh, great Max Scheler. Uh, and he says in many places, my philosophical position is unthinkable without either of these. I am who I am as a Christian personalist, thanks to my foundation in the Thomistic tradition, but equally thanks to my immersion in the personalist thought of the 20th century. So I see him as a bridge, uh, as a unifier, uh, uh, as a both and, uh, breaking new ground on the basis of the Catholic philosophical tradition. Yeah, correct me if I'm wrong, but this was uh, a lot of the topic that you guys just discussed at a recent Hildebrand Project conference, right? Uh, the relationship yeah, even between St. Thomas himself and, right. and the personalists, uh, Dietrich von Hildebrand especially, but others. Right, right, exactly. So we had a conference on the heart, uh, uh, namely the center of our feeling life and affective life. And you have a very original um, uh, affirmation of, uh, and, and very original exploration of the heart in von Hildebrand. And so we discussed, well, how does this stand in relation to Aristotle and St. Thomas? And we tried to draw out the continuity, but also a certain originality that is there in von Hildebrand on that subject. This is playing into uh, the, the development of doctrine that uh, was it's yeah, promoted, right, obviously, exactly. by your, your favorite John exactly. Henry Newman. Just like yeah. you've got the development of doctrine, uh, you saw there's a certain uh, development of philosophical understanding. But John Paul is, um, you know, he's a, a, a leader there in uh, facing and, and appropriating the uh, riches, but also removing the poison uh, from uh, the best in contemporary personalism. Well, you know, that a lot of people don't realize that uh, when Carol Wojtyla went to Rome, he studied under Father Garagou Lagrange, who right, is exactly. you know, one of the great 20th century right. Thomists. 
That's right. So he had a deep exposure. Uh, he wrote a dissertation on St. John of the Cross. It's interesting, though, he had disagreements with Father Garrigou Lagrange. And, well, I can imagine, uh, yeah. <laughs> Garrigou Lagrange wanted him to speak of God as object of the religious act. And he said, no, no, we can't say God is the object. He's a subject and supremely personal. And so already his his personalism was making itself felt in those early studies. Well, that's interesting that, that he would put it that way, that God is the subject, given the fact that our created end is for union with God as yeah. members of the divine family, like participating in the divine nature of God. Right. So it makes sense right. that if we're going to be interpersonally uh, treating each other as subjects in our yeah. human relationships, it would be the same way with God, who right. is literally yes. wedding us into his family uh, right. in the process yeah. of deification that we are undergoing right. in this life. Exactly, yeah. And if we don't have that um, sense, you know, of God uh, as a as person, then we get into different forms of even using God. You know, there's a kind of prayer, you know, where God is like a slot machine mm -hmm. who's used and manipulated for our purposes. And the antidote to that is to go deep into the sense of God as living person and our That's relation to God as an interpersonal relation. What, for you personally speaking, when you, what what impact did and has the the thought, the philosophy of John Paul II had, even on your interior life? Like, what, what did? Yeah. What does he mean to you? Yeah, yeah. No, it's um, it's it's a philosophy. Um, it, it's you know often presented in sort of difficult language, but once you break the ice and get into it, it's a philosophy that is close to life and close even to prayer life uh, and so um, for instance i began to understand in a new way what this thing of recollection is you know in the monastic tradition recollection saint benedict speaks of dwelling with oneself well i thought that, that's john paul's self-possession that's what you're cultivating right in recollect recollecting yourself you're going back to your inner center uh, and gathering yourself into one, so as to be able to give yourself. So uh, that, that that lit up for me, uh, John Paul's philosophy of the person and the religious practice of recollection. And of course, in with man and woman, I mean, my wife and I have experienced a tremendous uh, renewal of our own uh, married life through the encounter with John Paul's theology of the body. So it's a philosophy that it doesn't just remain, uh, you know, up in the clouds, but has tremendous power to connect you know, and, with the deepest uh, concerns. And, and a lot of that is because it starts with the person and it starts with our yeah. lived experience in so many That's ways. Right. And so people can relate to it. Once you kind of get through some of the philosophical language yeah. that's there, and sometimes he's tough sledding. I mean, he is to read. I remember yes. reading paragraphs over and over again in oh, graduate right. school as I was trying to read Love and Responsibility, yeah. for example. Yeah. But when you break through it, you're absolutely right. It is... It is something that speaks to our lived experience in a way that, that others don't. Yeah, that's right. It's close to experience. It touches the heart. And it is, bears fruit for your own inner life. I remember coming back from graduate school, I had taken um, my now father-in-law's course, uh, The Nature of Love. Oh, yes. Uh, and uh, I remember talking about this entire idea, Out of Love and Responsibility by Carol yeah. Wojtyla, about treating the other person as a subject and not an object and what that means in your interpersonal relationships. And I remember my sisters and my entire family is Protestant and uh, they just don't, you know, they don't move in these circles and they're just not exposed to these kinds of writings. And mm. when I described to them in my own kind of uh, low way, because I was just a mere student and just really getting my feet wet in it, I remember them looking at me with with wide eyes and their mouths, you know, their jaws were on the ground thinking, well, that makes total sense. That, that's yeah. really intriguing. And they wanted to know more. And so yes, this, right. this philosophy, this personalism has the ability, yeah. as you pointed out in the beginning of the, the program, to reach people where they yeah. are, uh, even yeah. when they're outside of the church. That's right. It, it's got tremendous evangelistic possibility. You know, if you start with, you know, uh, act and potency and the four causes, uh, you're going to lose uh, a, a lot of people. You talk, <laughs> right. Start with the person and what's due to persons and how this and that is a violation of the person. That can, that resonates. 
Yeah, the, the personalism here makes sense of not just our personhood, but our relationships with yes, others. Yeah. And, and it exactly. would seem yeah. to go a long no, that's, way that's toward... a wonderful feature. Yes. Yeah. And it would go a long way toward the, the, the issues that we find so often today uh, in, mm-hmm. in the public sphere. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's so much unrest even as we were recording this. And if we were living according to this personalist normal, we were, we were treating each other as subjects not to be used... Uh, yeah, but for someone, yeah, for me to give myself to, right, uh, yeah. and, and recognize the, the personal dignity that you have, there is a yeah. whole lot of, of yeah. problems that would go a lot, a, away uh, yeah. pretty quickly. Right. You know, he has, in that early book, you mentioned it, um, Love and Responsibility, which he wrote while he was still a bishop in uh, Poland. He has this most winning presentation of the virtue of chastity uh, because he shows how the different forms of unchaste behavior are really ways of using the other person. Uh, the very opposite, really, of loving them. And so this personalist rereading that he gives of chastity uh, is enormously winning. It's a good example of the evangelistic potential of his personalism. Well, we can speak to the fact that how many people were drawn into the into the faith by virtue, and how many vocations came out of uh, you know his oh, papacy. Yes, right. You know, it just we're we're still reaping the fruit of that uh, even now, and, yes. and so much of it is based. It, it, you know, it wasn't. It's not just something that was pie in the sky to him either, because this was something that he himself embodied. Right? I remember yes. seeing him yeah. right after I became Catholic. Just a few months afterwards, I was in yeah. Rome for a Wednesday audience. And I was probably 15 feet away from him, and you could feel yeah. this, this love that just seemed to cascade yeah. from him. And it, right. it right. made me stay in St. Peter's yeah. Square, even as a torrential downpour hit, and it was cold. <laughs> it was like October. But I, I wanted to yeah. be there with this man that you could just feel God's yeah. love just coming off of me, like in waves. Palpably, you could feel Not it. Not only not only the love uh, radiating from him, but the love radiating to each individual person. So many people testify, and I can too, that if you would meet him in a a reception line for just a matter of seconds, you had the sense that he was really present to you. He wasn't distracted looking on to the next person. He would look at you and he would take you in as a person. So his way of even greeting people was eminently personalistic. What a perfect way for a spiritual father to treat his children. Yes. Yeah. Would that we, all of us fathers, were like that all the time. Know. And us teachers, too. Us teachers, too. You know. <laughs> Truly. Dr. Crosby, this has been a fascinating conversation, and I, I want to thank you for, for gracing us with your presence. And I just want to remind people that uh, the name of the book is The Personalism of John Paul II. Again, it is not a long read. It is not full of philosophical language, no, so to speak. It no, is a no. great intro guide to the thought of John Paul II. And, I, right. and hopefully it leads you, you know, springboards you to other uh, deeper writings of theology of the body yeah. and, and such that uh, that the Pope gave us because they they really have enriched our philosophical and theological thought as Catholics right. and enriched yeah. our lives. Uh, you yeah. know, both of us can attest to that personally. Uh, I owe a great yes. deal to John Paul II. Named my yeah. first son after him. Yeah. yeah, that's right. And I named one of my sons after him too. <laughs> <laughs> now, so, where would be the best place for for people to uh, to grab the book? Uh, you know, it's uh, on Amazon, uh, but um, you can also uh, order it directly through the Hildebrand Project uh, on campus here at Franciscan University. I think the price comes to the same thing, whether it's ordered here or through Amazon. So it's not uh, too difficult to acquire, and I hope not too difficult to read. It originated actually as a series of talks that I gave on EWTN about 20 years ago. So I knew I had a broad audience, non-specialist, so I tried to cut back to the essentials. And you did. You did a fabulous yeah. job. I, I really enjoyed digging back into it. It kind of brought me back to graduate school again. It was a great <laughs> reminder of, of just how yeah. powerful John Paul II's thought yeah. really yeah. is. Yeah. yeah, it has power. Life-changing power. Yeah. Yes, amen. <laughs> well, thank you again very much, Dr. Well, Crosby. It was a pleasure to have you. Gladly, Gladly. Thank you for inviting me uh, to share this with your 
audience and your friends. God bless you. Uh, God bless you, man. Good.